Good morning, everybody. Um, good morning. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. When we first got on here earlier this morning with Eddie, it was still morning, and now we've moved <laughs> one minute later, and we are in the afternoon. And Eddie, we'd like to welcome you. Uh, thank you. Sorry for that uh, slight delay, colleagues. There was a slight technical issue we were sorting out. Um, and uh, we just want to welcome you all um, to the session. Um, I see a number of familiar faces here. It is really, indeed, it is uh, good to have Eddie, Dr. Cottle, um, with us today. I see a number of uh, faces from uh, organized labor, um, or let me say, I see the, the link, uh, the leadership of uh, organized labor in the province. I see a number of academics um, uh, here on the platform. Um, and I also want to welcome my colleagues um, from EXEC, uh, comrades and friends. Uh, let me say welcome to the session. Indeed, it is a special session for us as EXEC. Um, as you know, EXEC is a multi-stakeholder um, uh, uh, council um, that seeks to, to drive um, uh, partnership uh, engagements and collaborative um, engagements across all sectors in the province, including um, organized labor, which forms part of our constituent council. Um, just like NEDLAC at National, EXEC has been in existence since 1995 and uh, labor and organized labor has always been and remains important to, to the council. Um, having said that, um, I'm not going to take up any uh, time. I want to just introduce the speaker. I'm sure the speaker doesn't really need much introduction to most of our visitors on the platform. It is well known within the, the labor movement within civil society. Um, and I think we are all familiar in the progressive uh, sector um, of society. I think most of us are familiar with his work, if not with a person uh, on a personal level and on a, on an activist political level. Um, I want to take this opportunity to, to just in, in, um, acknowledge uh, some of our guests on this platform who are joining us taking the time to be here this morning. Um, firstly, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, Eddie and just say thank you, Dr. Cottle. Um, I'm going to introduce you once I've uh, just welcomed everybody, but I just want to again say thank you to uh, Eddie Cottle, Dr. Cottle, for making um, and, and taking the time to share this, uh, um, to share this paper essentially. And this paper, Eddie, I'm not sure you'll tell us if the paper was already published, has been published, and where people can get the publication online. Um, but uh, we want to just say thank you. I want to take this opportunity now also to welcome, I see uh, Professor Janet Cherry. Uh, Janet, we want to just take this opportunity to welcome you. Thank you for joining us. I would like to welcome Pharrell Hunter. Thank you for joining us today. Um, Michelle Buerta, I also want to take the opportunity to welcome the leadership of organized labor in the province in particular. And in particular, I'd like to uh, uh, welcome um, the provincial secretary of Nahau, Mr. Lu Kapai, provincial chairperson of SAMU, Mr. Zolani Ndlela, the first general um, deputy general secretary of Popkuru, uh, Zamakaya Skade, the PSA organizing officer, Ms. Pumla Pelingkela, and then Kusatu provincial organizer, Mr. Zoli Pola. Um, I also want to say, comrades and friends, um, welcome to the session. Relax, make yourself at home. Um, and uh, by way of introduction now, uh, I'm going to just basically, I want to read, I think for the benefit of those who do not know Dr. Cottle and his background, um, I want to take this opportunity to introduce him um, and just uh, read his profile um, to you. Um, if you know the man and uh, you've seen the profile, um, it always amazes me, his humility, how he am humble and, and the humility that uh, he he, with which he carries himself always. And I've had the privilege of um, spending time with him on a personal level. 
uh, as he was my neighbor. I used to walk past my place with his dog very regularly. <laughs> so um, he is always humble. Uh, and one almost has to say, Eddie, your work is you are so prolific in your work. So I'm humbled and I'm honored to have him on this platform today. So for those, I'm going to read it out to you. Um, it is a senior researcher uh, in the field of labor studies uh, with a scholarly focus on theorizing of labor strikes. Um, by the way, uh, he also focused and contributed in his PhD to strike theory um, in the country, uh, looking at long range uh, data, working with uh, long range data uh, on strike, analyzing strikes in the country over the 100 years. And I'm sure he'll talk to that. Uh, he's, uh, he's an uh, uh, um, strikes, uh, theorizing on strikes, which is an under researched area globally in labor studies field. He's uh, particularly interested in strike theory, labor history, strike statistics, comparative studies in social uh, conflict. Uh, in respect of his contribution to scholarly and policy influencing labor research, uh, he was a contributor to the South African Labor Bulletin since 1999, um, currently a reviewer for the Labor uh, Journal and the Brazilian Journal of Social and Labor Economics. Since 2007, he contributed to the Labor Research um, Service LRS annual omnibus book, Bargaining Indicators. Uh, he was also contracted uh, uh, to the International Labor Organization, the ILO, um, in Switzerland, of uh, Africa offers to write the popular book uh, towards a South African national minimum wage, which was widely used in the labor movement in preparations for the negotiations on the national minimum wage with government. Um, and uh, uh, he's also the editor of the book, South Africa's World Cup, A Legacy for Whom. Um, and uh, so colleagues, we are really uh, privileged to have Dr. Cottle here. Um, and uh, Eddie, the title today um, for, for, for today's uh, talk is Industrial Action in South Africa, um, 2000 to 2000 and, uh, 2019, the Reading Strike Statistics. And for us, it's particularly interesting. Uh, and for those of you joining, I think also the, from a theoretical perspective and theory building perspective, um, I think the contribution is unique because uh, we we'll just take the title and the abstract. Um, the 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 issue around uh, making sense and using qualitative quantitative data is quite unique in in looking at strike theory. And so, Dr. Cottle, I'm going to hand over to you um, at this point. And then, colleagues, I'll ask you all just some housekeeping to keep your 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 um, please mute, please mute. Uh, um, and keep your make sure your systems are on mute, and then thereafter uh, we will open up for for engagement. So welcome. I'll hand over to you, Dr. Kotel. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Barry and and Exec uh, for the um, invitation. Uh, can everyone hear me clearly? Can, can you hear me, Barry? Finally, I'm in. Yes, yes, sure. yes. Yeah. I can hear you. Okay. And I ask uh, colleagues, uh, participants, uh, comrades, friends, can we please uh, all just put on mute? Uh, yes, Eddie, you audible and you can proceed. Uh, okay. You can share the presentation. I will just, when you're ready. Yeah, no, thank you very, very much. And for all of you who are attending, I think one of the most remarkable um, issues in, in our country and probably globally where we have long histories of strikes um, is just how few people actually study strikes. Most of the works in South Africa um, on strikes are really focused on the trade unions. And trade unions are not the only centers of strikes. In fact, in the long history of capitalism in South Africa since the early phases, since the 1840s, most strikes um, actually happen outside of trade unions. And that's why my uh, presentation is more about what is the strike 10 trends um, of the labor movement, um, trying to look at the movement as a whole. And of course, quite concerning furthermore is the fact that how very few universities uh, don't um, have labor studies um, as a subject um, of the curriculums, 
Um, but furthermore, uh, they don't study strikes um, as a subject matter, and that's part of my, my I think my ambition really is to introduce the study of strikes um, to the general public, because these days we also find that even trade unions don't discuss strikes, and like I think we did in the 80s, for example, uh, where you had very in-depth discussion on a strike and its outcomes and lessons drawn, and then preparations for the new strikes. So in a way, the, the idea, although we have strikes happening often in the country, uh, and there are big social upheavals um, through them, there is actually very little study going on. So really, in fact, you have the Department of Labor who studies strikes and they release their annual report. And then you have basically Andrew Levy and Associates, uh, who basically services the private sector and they have their own independent um, analysis of strikes. It's very difficult to access the data because you have to pay something like 70,000 Rand um, to access their data. So it's been a very difficult journey. So I must thank you from the bottom of my heart for this invitation. It's a very lonely um, place to be. But let me go into the um, presentation um, quickly. Um, can everyone see the screen? Barry, can you hear me? Yes, we can Eddie, hear you. We can, can see, see the it. presentation. Perfectly. Okay. All right. No, thanks a lot. Um, so my aims are basically the following in this presentation is to actually look at the statistics of the last 20 years so that it can help us understand what is the state of labor, organized and unorganized. The key component of the webinar is to show how we can use the quantitative method to assist in reading the qualitative aspects of worker mobilization. Um, by utilizing this quantitative method, I will be able to show whether the labor movement as an agent is withering away, who the leading sections are per industrial sector, and the shifts over time, including the relative performance of blue collar workers to white collar workers. And I will in finally show that from a long term perspective, um, it is very important to look at the strike trends. Otherwise, we have basically a lot of short term analysis and the short term analysis has a lot of errors in how they view the labor movement and how to also assess. I think a lot of the assessments in South Africa is more on the state of organization and the surveys often are about what are the opinions of shop stewards. Those are, of course, very, very important, but it doesn't give us a sense of where is the labor movement and how it, sh how it shifts over long periods of time. And that's very important if we are able to have a sober assessment of the state of labor. Now, it is very fascinating that most people don't know that actually Lenin and Trotsky actually studied strike statistics on a very detailed level. Those who are also familiar with some of the analysis provided by Lenin, I don't think have quite understood how he utilized the method to show what the qualitative meanings are of um, strike data, for example. But both Lenin and Trotsky used the data to actually gauge who is leading in the labor movement, where are they located, and how, what can you read in terms of the subjectiveness um, are the way workers are struggling. And they use this method basically to gauge and prepare for the Russian Revolution. And this work I've done um, is published elsewhere. It is a in the, the Workers of the World Journal where I write about Lenin and Trotsky's method um, on strike statistics. What I've done really is to lift what I thought were, were the important ways in which they utilize strike statistics and uh, develop it for a a broader kind of, of, of process, or at least for the contemporary uh, period um, in South Africa and globally. Um, so in terms of studying the qualitative dimensions of strike data, we first need to look at what are the quantitative, key quantitative variables. So in the country and generally within you in business or you in the public sector, um, the study is centered around strike frequency, which you can see on the left is F days lost to production, which is D, and S, which is for the number of strikers. Now, what Lennon did was, when he examined days lost to production, 
and he studied workers closely. He assessed actually days lost to production, which is a narrow economic concept, which is really there for business um, and government to assess the damage to any e e sector or the economy. But it also indicated something about workers themselves. And for him, it determined the extent to which workers are prepared to make sacrifices. In other words, how how many days or weeks or months are workers prepared to to make sacrifices? And in studying the Russian society and the workers movement, he came to a conclusion that it was the metal workers were the most determined workers um, in Russia, and therefore the metal workers uh, were the, the vanguard of the workers movement. Both him and Trotsky, of course, also focused on, on X, which was the number of strikers. And here, of course, was the fact that in certain periods you have more workers on strike than in other periods. And this we call the ebb and flow um, of class struggle. But S in particular, when workers came out in the mass, uh, indicates you have periods of higher levels um, of consciousness and periods where more workers are prepared to come out on strike. From my own contribution, I have looked at strike frequency, which is F, the number of strikes um, per, per year. And for me, F basically means that what we engage from F really is a change in nature in the organizational capacity um, of workers to struggle. So these three indicators, which are quantitative indicators, F, D, and S, if we translate them into qualitative labels, we can then read uh, the long trends in strike activity with a different lens. Um, because most of the time, if you say F, D, or S, it's really almost me meaningless in because you can only say, well, strikes have gone up um, or they've gone down and so on. But I've actually now updated the data of yesterday to include 2020. So we now have from 20. 2000 to 2020. And through this, by doing this, we can now examine uh, the curve of the class struggle um, in South Africa. OK. Now, if we look from the, the left of the screen in 2000, we can see from 2000, 2001 till about 2004, the strike trend was down, the downward trend. And at the and in 2004, when the Department of Labor released their report, they argued that basically we've now seen the end of um, spikes in uh, the high number of strikes. We are entering a new period of uh, more kind of uh, regular and more stabilized labor relations environment. And of course, quite contrary to the expectation, to their expectation, by 2005, there was a spike in strike waves, and that spike in in the strike waves lasted uh, from about 2005 to about 2014. Um, a 10-year wave of strikes occurred in South Africa. Now, this is very interesting because over that entire 10-year period where we had this volume, high volume of strike activity, most people and commentators didn't notice that we were actually in a new phase um, of mobilization in the labor movement. And uh, the reason why they couldn't really understand that is because there is no seriousness in looking at strikes, in terms of studying strikes as a very important barometer um, um, of struggle, but also indicating that change is happening uh, within the, the labor movement. Now, there, there is then the wave of 2005 to 2007, you then have the uh, the depression, uh, 2008, 2009, you can see there's a downward spiral, and then it spikes up again during the World Cup 2010, and moving through Marikana, um, and then of course going down in the five month platinum strike. But the strike seems to continue in terms of the upsurge, despite the downward trend in 2020 with the hard luck lockdown. And that tells us that the working class or the labor movement as a whole is still very combative, despite all the, I think, the the the, the kind of negative assessments of the labor movement, uh, I think, over the last 20-year um, period. 
And if we look at days lost to production, which tells us the how determined workers are to, to strike, we can see that they all peaks in 2007. And here we actually saw the, the entry of the public sector workers coming in, um, including in 2010, leading in long um, um, struggles, um, of course, to improve the lot of workers in the public sector. But the most interesting thing about this entire period from 2005 onwards is that all industries were combative. Um, not a single industry was left out of strikes in almost any of the years. And one of the more fascinating aspects, if you understand that that strike waves mark qualitative as well as quantitative changes, if you study the details of each of these periods, you begin to see new, way, new ways in which strike tactics are employed, new levels of coordination, that there are new ideas and also policies, and also the drawing in of workers in areas where there hasn't been strike activity. So, for example, in 2005 was the first year in which you had farm workers coming out in strikes, and this was led by FAWU, which then was also extended to the fishing industries and so on. Um, you also had the first strike, national strike of gold mining workers since, um, since 1987. You had the first strikes of SAA, um, and you had the first time in which trade unions were beginning to demand an equalization of um, remuneration and conditions of employment for casual, seasonal, um, and uh, permanent workers. A new tactic that was also brought about was the tactic of, um, of unions having multi-stakeholder negotiations and multi, sorry, multi-union agreements. Um, and that kind of approach started to develop over this entire period of the 20-year um, period. I'll come into more of the details of the different strikes at a later stage. But what we can see really, what we can see here is in fact, despite claims, the organizational capacity of the labor movement has increased. It has not decreased um, over the last 20-year um, period. What the data does show, if you look at days lost production, which is the, the red here, is the curve um, here shows that it peaked in 2010, this is how determined workers were, and began to decline, right? In other words, after the 10 year wave from over here to about over here, the workers' determination levels dropped. Now, this is very important because there's only a certain amount of time in which workers can um, endure long periods of strike action. And 10 years is actually a very significant and very long time. And uh, I th don't think there are many countries in the world where you can have strike waves um, lasting 10 years um, as a consecutive wave um, of strikes. So it takes a lot of psychological, financial, um, and emotional resources of workers to be able to endure um, such long periods of struggle. And of course, that determination level must drop uh, over a particular course of time. Um, and that tells us also that if you take then the strikes from 2014, 2015 onwards, if the strike determinant levels are dropping, right, that also tells us that fewer workers are involved that these workers here must be largely coming from smaller industries. And I'll explain some of that maybe um, later, where you have the larger entity of smaller industry um, coming into play rather than the larger unions. Um, so strike determination tells us that the determinant levels, determination levels are back to 2000. So it's basically we're back over here. If we look at determination to struggle, compared there, and um, I think I've explained that. Um, so essentially it means that we ha we are in a period where, where, where workers are exhausted, basically, financially, physically, and uh, psychologically. Coming to the strikes and uh, strikers, um, what we can see really is that after 
2000, there was a dramatic downturn in the amount of workers participating. And there's once again a conversion with the 2005 sec wave. And that basically peaks again in 2010 because of the World Cup. Um, but from 2011, we can see it is going further and further down. So the days lost to production and the number of strikers tell us then conclusively that we've entered a period of a retreat. In other words, the mass of workers have entered a period of retreat despite an increase in the amount of strikes going up. And as I've said earlier on, this tells us that these are workers in smaller industries who have now come into to action. Uh, maybe it means that workers who were not that active in the prior 10 year wave have become more active um, after 2014. Um, but that's basically the state of play where we are currently. Um, but I think in terms of the period 2016 to 2020, which is over here, over here, there seems to be some kind of sentiments that the workers are trying to get back into action. In other words, there seems to be uh, a, a kind of maybe the, the ebb is about to turn into a flow again. Um, and I think it's very important we understand that notion of ebb and flow because sometimes we don't see much action uh, for a period of five years and we think that the labor movement has collapsed. It hasn't collapsed. Um, because workers need a respite from the financial conditions they live um, in order to gather the resources um, to an energy to, to, to struggle again. Um, we got that. OK, now this is very interesting here. What we have then is a long term trend of protected and unprotected strikes. Unfortunately, the statistics is broken and therefore I couldn't um, get a, a longer term trend um, on this. Um, as we can see then, I think which confirms my, my analysis is that if you take um, the period, where am I going up from here, 2017 onwards, where there is, where essentially unprotected strikes is overtaking protected strikes by a large margin. Okay. Uh, now, the interesting thing here is that we don't really know who are all part of those unprotected strikes? Because workers who are organized also initiate unprotected strikes. And there has been quite a large scale occurrence um, of workers belonging to trade unions embarking on unprotected strikes. Of course, largely because they believe that the unions are not capable um, of dealing adequately um, with their demands. Um, but at the same time, we found that there has also been a large scale uh, amount of workers who are not part of formal unionization. Uh, those who are seasonal, those who are more casualized, also going on uh, unprotected strikes. But this is a very significant moment, um, I think, for the labor movement. It is a very telling time for the, for the labor movement to actually assess where they are at because we don't know whether this in the future, this trend will continue or subside. And that can only tell us that in the future, alternative unions will emerge in terms of a longer term trend. Um, if nothing happens uh, to, to deal more substantively with worker-based um, um, concerns. Uh, moving back in terms of the recent trends, between 2012 and 2020, there is an unprecedented increase in the share of unprotected strikes. The trend is for both organized and unorganized labor to, to embark in strike action. Uh, the key thing then in the, the more recent period is that most of these strikes are being initiated by smaller industries where there is a smaller workforce. Uh, and there is, in a sense, a new phenomenon which is that the amount of days lost to production by unorganized strikes is increasing. Um, and it increased to a phenomenal 12.3% in 2018. I suspect that this will increase further, but we don't have data uh, on that at the moment. Um, the, the leap in the proportion of days lost 
uh, attributed to other organizers work is, is therefore an extremely significant factor um, in the last, I think, 15 or so years. Um, OK, now we're going to move basically from the macro to the industry level. So I think in a lot of the theory that we have um, in sociology, politics and in academia is that um, the labor movement really is not an agent of change, that there are other sectors in society, students, identity movements and so on that are in that should be in the forefront. What they term social movements um, will basically are overtaking the labor movement. But I don't think that that is actually the case. I think what is happening is that um, a lot of thinking because of this illusionment with labor, a lot of the studies moved away from labor and therefore uh, there is a huge gap in how people are analyzing the social movements as a whole in our society. But let's take a look at strikes then in terms of number of strikes, which is frequency. It is quite interesting that the highest number of strikes is taking place in the community service sector, which is also the public sector. And that was 637 strikes over a 20 year period, making up 32.7% of all strikes. The second largest amount of strikes is in manufacturing with 18.3. Um, and the third highest is in mining, 12.2%, followed by transport. Now, if you study then the makeup of the industries from um, agriculture downwards to about transport, we can obviously say more or less that these are largely what is termed blue collar industries. Um, we can't quite uh, discern the exact numbers of workers are white collar in those industries and uh, blue collar. So this is just a kind of a maybe a, a broad wide uh, estimation. And then clearly from transport, um, sorry, from um, finance and business services to community or white collar workers. So if we take then the percentage of strikes in each of these um, industries and divide them up between blue collar and white collar, we find that 64% of all strikes are taking place in the blue in blue collar industries. Right. Now, this is a very, very significant finding, and it disputes the notion that blue collar workers are no longer agents um, and that it's basically the service industry. That has taken over um, in terms of the broad economies um, of the world, and I think this is a widespread kind of a consensus um, that is reached, um, I think, in, in, in academia. But the facts speak differently, and I think this is why strikes and statistics are so important to study. Is actually to look at the concrete uh, aspects of the way and where workers are, are, are struggling. Uh, if we take days lost per industry, or the most determined workers, let me use the qualitative label, the most determined workers in terms of aggregate data is then um, the, the public sector, community services, um, with uh, 13,604 days lost per thousand workers. Sorry, sorry, not community services. Um, mining. <laughs> mining has is the highest in terms of uh, days lost to production per thousand workers. And if we use the Leninist concept, um, he would have argued that mine workers are the most determined workers in the country and constitute, constitute the vanguard um, of the, the workers' movement. This is followed then by the public sector. Um, although the public sector, if you just add the figures on an aggregate level, it'll be higher than mining. But to ensure that we have a way of comparing, because the public sector is very big, the determination level of workers, we then have to look at workers' uh, days lost per thousand. And that will change the picture, giving us the idea that mine workers are actually leading as the most determined workers. I think for the labor movement and for organized labor, of course, this figure is, of course, very important as well, right? Because transport workers seem to be a seriously huge contender uh, in the last, I think, uh, 20 years, and have been moving up the ladder in terms of strikes and also in terms of strike determination. And we will see some of the changes over over time in the in the next uh, um, strikes. Okay, now here what I've done really is look at 
five year intervals and look at how the different industries change in terms of their performance of being the most determined workers um, in the in the country. Now mining and community be becomes top. They seem to be running at number one and number two, largely over a, a two sorry a twenty year period. But there is a significant showing of transport from two thousand levels onwards, and surprisingly, manufacturing is at number four, and that also tells us that the period excuse me, um, of manufacturing workers um, being the most determined um, of workers is no more. That period of which came from the 70s, which ran through the 80s and into the 90s, um, it means that manufacturing workers are no longer really the leading force um, in the country in terms of, of, of labor movement and, 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 and struggle. I think for me, one of the most significant aspects of this is actually agriculture. If you look at the left of the screen at number eight in 2000, normally agriculture was always lost um, in prior statistical years, but agriculture is moving up the ladder. And by 2010, I mean, this is a dramatic shift that is now it moved to number five and it held the position fairly well, although it's number six in the last uh, recent period. Um, so we have actually new in industries or, or sectors we, which are overtaking other um, 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 industries which have held on for, for, for a very long time. So transport, electricity and agriculture seemingly have moved up in terms of their ranking, in terms of workers who are very determined um, to win the demands. Um, I think community, for example, will still hold and maybe will move up in the next uh, um, period, for example, maybe overtake electricity again. But I think what I think this tells the labor movement and, into, and also for organized labor movement is that they have to take stock in the changing nature of, of struggle within the different um, um, industries uh, within our economy to see where workers are actually more determined to struggle um, than in than in other areas, so to speak. Also, I think what was quite interesting is that business and finance actually moved up. Sorry, that's trade year number four in the period 2005 to 2009, which means that actually workers who are employed in finance and business services are not as docile as I think a lot of the literature tries and make them out to be. And I think there's much to be done um, within that sector uh, as well. OK. In trying to sum up this presentation, uh, basically what it showed really is that the most determined workers in our country um, over the last 20 years of Vanguard um, is mining workers. Of course, that is in that has been exemplified through Marikana and also the historic five month platinum strike for clear demonstrations of, of, of power. Mine workers who are blue collar are then followed by public sector workers as the most determined workers in the country. Um, of special interest, as I've shown, is that transport workers have overtaken that of workers in manufacturing as workers who are more determined to win um, the struggles. After decades of a low rank, agriculture has in the recent years moved upwards. And I've been following some of the strikes in agriculture, and it is very, very clear that there are uh, lots of struggles that are taking place in agriculture. And I think there was in the recent few years that the wave of strikes which were in the Western Cape have now moved to the Eastern Cape. And I think that's also very important for the unions based in Eastern Cape to, to consider what has been happening to workers within the agricultural sector. Uh, taking stock now over the last while and just moving back, this is part of my PhD. It's really to look at the long wave of strikes over long periods of time and their relationship to the rate of profit and the increase in strikes. Now, I'm going to move to basically, um, you can see over here, this is the period of the 80s, which we saw, or let me start over here. If you can remember the birth of the trade union movement, it centers around this period over here. 
And now what is very interesting of this period of year is that you have sharp increases in the rates of profit, which moves over. And these sharp movements in the rate of profit upward movements provide huge breathing spells for workers to struggle. In other words, workers become more confident when they can see that the, the, the economy is growing and they can make more serious demands on employers to make concessions. But what is very interesting is that all the high peaks of struggle for the labor movement occurs in periods where you have massive spikes in increases in the rate of profit. And so when we come to the recent period of 2005, where the strike, the 10 year strike wave started, we can see here also that the spikes in the increases in profit uh, was also quite prevalent. And then with the overall contraction in the economy, this is the kickstart, right? And then you have basically an increase in the number um, of strikes happening. We are currently over here somewhere. In other words, South Africa with the whole of the global economy, we are actually sinking quite far down the ladder in terms of a contraction uh, in the the, the economy. Um, and this is the thing about strikes that I think I've learned over the last um, period is that we have to keep an open mind and that all strikes matter, no matter how small. And I think any union must take any struggle very, very seriously. Because given a specific socioeconomic context at the, road, at the right moment, a small strike can trigger a major upsurge in the level of struggle or strike action um, in the country. And if we take the Western Cape farm worker strike in 2012, in my view, this is actually the most important strike of the early 21st century in South Africa. And I think the story here is how you had a group of women whose working conditions were changed from that being to being employed as permanent workers who were changed to become seasonal workers. And they then embarked on a strike, which then started a rupture uh, in farming uh, during that period in 2012, which resulted in the first social uprising in South Africa. In other words, what we had was extremely significant because it was the first time that you had a strikes in the sphere of production triggering a social um, uprising um, in the sphere of, of reproduction. And this was basically by a group of seasonal workers. And that's basically the point I'm trying to make about taking all strikes very, very seriously. Um, and of course, the ruptures of the strike was very, very powerful, um, where government was forced to announce a 52% increase in the official minimum wage. And of course, this then gave rise to the government's review um, of the minimum wage, which a lot of workers are now benefiting from. So all these benefits, of course, you can you can find these sources and you can trace all these major ruptures, even in terms of concessions to, to, to wages or to law, um, to these kinds of strikes. So what we had then in the first 21st century, very, very early in the 21st century, is the first mass strike in South Africa, which must tell us that it's not going to be the, going to be the last. Um, so that's the end of my um, presentation. Thank you very much. Oops. Thank you very much, uh, Eddie, Dr. Koto, for that presentation. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you very much for that insightful presentation. And as you were doing that historical perspective, um, uh, as you took us through the sectors and uh, the dynamics in the labor action and strike over that historic period, um, one, you know, um, I actually was reminded, uh, as we all were, that uh, 2022 marks a significant uh, period and significant year in um, the history of labor action um, and, uh, and 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 strike, I think, in the labor movement in the country. Um, 
if you, not just for Marikana, although we commemorated 10 years of Marikana now during this month, the Marikana massacre, but those of you who have a longer perspective as you do and others of the labor movement and um, uh, in the country. Uh, also, we celebrate, we commemorate the 100 years of the 1922 Rand Mine Workers um, uh, massacre, uh, which was uh, a different time. Um, the different, the, the, the movement looked different at that point, at that time, but uh, historically, uh, I think also at this month, at this time, uh, uh, this perspective for me just also um, uh, illustrates that uh, long trajectory of labor action in the country. Um, I want to acknowledge the hands that uh, were, were raised. Colleagues, I hope you can bear with me. Um, I did indicate in the chat, um, and please just to let you know the chat is there. Um, I will ask. Uh, I will also keep an eye on the chat if you want to put your comments in the chat. Um, Pharrell uh, Hunter, I saw your hand uh, was up and uh, uh, I noted in the chat that we will now open for comments and for engagement. So Skade, I see your hand is also up. Um, I think you would put your hand down, but uh, I'm going to open up now for comments. Um, I'm going to let the colleague in. Just hold. Um, so I want to take a, a, a show of hands, maybe a few hands, and then I'm going to I note you, Pharrell. Um, I'm going to, anyone else maybe that wants to put up their hand? Anyone else wants to come in? So Pharrell, I note your hand was up uh, for a while now, so I'm going to hand over to you. Please come in. Uh, Thanks, Barry, and thanks, Eddie. A uh, very insightful um, presentation, and your, for your study over over a period. Um, basically, there are two questions. The one at the point that I raised, um, and I I don't have that. Well, maybe you can pop the slide up again if if necessary, Eddie. But the one where you showed the four periods, uh, five year periods. Um, where there was a shift in uh, the, the focus. The, the question is really just a descriptive one in terms of when you say trade, the category of trade, uh, what does that cover? Um, so that's the first part, but it's a, as I say, that's quite a simple one, uh, as in just a description. If I can then follow up with something that's a bit different that um, I noted, you, you referred to um, periods of strike also where there were factors you indicated, I think, that might have influenced, um, you know, the peak or the dips in, in the rate of strikes. Um, of those, I think you indicated uh, worker exhaustion, um, uh, economic conditions, uh, you know, whether there was profit taking on the part of, of uh, the, the business of capital and so forth. I've just wondered whether at any point, because I'm not sure I heard it come through, whether periods of depolitization perhaps, you know, among working class within the labor movement, things also like the split in, in the large, um, you know, federations. Uh, we saw, I mean, just the strike of yesterday, the, the you know, where, where um, this in some ways was important, but in some ways also confirmed that split. I'm wondering what other factors there might have been there for other than exhaustion or economic uh, conditions. And you may have raised it, so sorry if I if I overlooked that. Yeah, but thanks if you catch the question. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Pharrell, please come in. Uh, Pharrell, you had your hand Please ask your question. Come through. Did we lose uh, Skade? So uh, while we're waiting, uh, does anybody else want to have a question? Hello. Hello. Skade, is that you? Hello. Hello, we hear you. Do you want to come through with your question? Yes, this is me. Hey, 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 hey I've yeah, listened I've... to the. Let me welcome firstly the the presentation. 
there has been this notion of uh, worker unions or trade unions being stronger on 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 the public sector than in the private sector. Uh, Professor, have you looked at what now going forward? Uh, I know uh, we we have had an action yesterday, and part of what I I I I, I admired yesterday was the presence of many worker federations struggling for one uh, demand. What now? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, anybody, can I see if there's any other hand? Any, in the absence of another hand, can I throw in a question quickly and abuse my uh, privilege as the chair here? Um, sure. Interestingly, Eddie, the um, frequency, or let me say the determination for uh, worker action seems to be higher in, um, you mentioned particularly, the um, the mining, you call it the mining sector, ne? Um, and then obviously you also noted the agricultural sector, which included um, um, the fishing, um, uh, 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 um, the fishing uh, sector. For me, I wanted to ask you from a, uh, without calling it a Marxist ecological perspective, ne? but from a socio ecological perspective, um, uh, and maybe to not just to you, but maybe just to throw it there to the group. It's interesting to see uh, what do you make of that uh, correlation that we see this intensification of labor action and determination within the sectors that are so close to the land, so close to natural resources. Um, and if you take uh, into context the fact that um, um, there's also this notion in theory, particularly in, I would say, um, uh, in some uh, in in more contemporary Marxist literature on the ecological perspective, that um, the 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 focus or exploitation and capital in late capital has been towards natural resource exploitation of nature, vis a vis uh, labor um, labor value, and take energy, take the super profits to be derived of mineral. Uh, exploiting natural resources. So I'm just find it so interesting that those two sectors stand out now. Is what do you make of that? And maybe just to throw it to the panel also. Thanks. Okay. Um, the question on the sectors. Let me just go back here. Um, right. Um, trade the trade at seven really is um, wholesale and retail uh, and hospitality sectors that that constitute. Um, trade um, in terms of the statistics. Um, now, the the factors that give rise to um, um, demobilization. Um, one of the key things that I think run through the history of workers is that workers who are really starving um, uh, struggle basically to embark on strike action. Um, this is why you'll find that uh, more or less, even if there are workers in smaller industries embarking on strikes, as I've showed in the last uh, five year period, those strikes are actually over a very short space of time. So you might have more workers in smaller industries, for example, going on strike, but it, it, the determinant, determination levels are lower in general. Doesn't mean that in specific circumstances, they can just go for it. Um, and that's because also that their resources at their disposal is also smaller and shorter. And that in part, I think, can also explain uh, one of the reasons why other workers are more prepared to, to strike compared uh, to, to others. So the, the, the economic condition of workers do play a very, very important role. 
um, in, in, in people um, striking uh, or wanting to embark on struggle. And in terms of my 140 year assessment of strike data, what I've been able to find really is that the theory, which has been quite dominant out there, which is that worker strike will strike harder um, under periods of crisis is actually not true. Um, so, for example, during the period of 2008, 2009, when the crash happened, uh, there were actually fewer strikes than in periods where you have upswings or sudden bursts um, of profit. You must remember also that when I'm talking here about bursts of profit, I'm talking about swings of eight years, for example, before the, the ebb comes and, and, and steps in. So issues of, of, of workers struggling, workers will struggle despite a trade union. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is that the, the material condition to strike is not a trade union. The material condition to strike is the workplace and its impact on the ability of those at work to reproduce their families. Um, so in the history of strikes since they began in 1840 in this country, not uh, 1900 or 1998, as some people say, uh, the vast, the most strikes happen outside of trade unions. The distinction between what I come to Farrell's point is the distinction factor is that trade unions play a very particular role or they have played a very particular role. They have not been playing that role in the recent periods, and that is a, probably a topic for another webinar, is that their own depoliticization of themselves. In other words, because of the new dispensation, there appears to be a phase in which the unions are basically accommodating the industrial relations system and not viewing the, the purpose as to challenge the industrial relations system. And that I think is the major stumbling block for the trade unions because they began to work nine to five, right? Uh, and not to think that they have to undermine the industrial relations systems. They have to because capital consistently undermines the unions and they consistently, they never sleep. They consistently undermine workers at the point um, um, of production. Now coming, I'm going to skip um, and go to, to Barry's question. And the reason why you found that you had these sudden changes, and that's also a topic for another webinar, <laughs> which goes with my long wave thesis, uh, is that what you've had uh, since probably 1994 onwards was the rate of capital intensity of production increased phenomenally. Um, over the last 20 year period. And when the rate of profit started to decline in 2005, as I showed on that um, graph, um, over, okay, let me just go there. Uh, when the rate of profit started to decline, what happened was the public sector and the private sector tried to embark on greater levels of uh, outsourcing labor broking and casualization. Um, and also what we found really is the introduction of new technologies as well to look at how they can increase the rate of profit. So the foundation is for example, land, where of course you find uh, the mining workers and agricultural workers was a deep seated response to these changes that were occurring um, with at the point of production, agribusiness in particular was consolidating itself, uh, buying and buying more land, the rates of bankruptcy um, of smaller farmers uh, who couldn't make it uh, to meet the market demands of, of an export driven um, system. And of course, the issue of miners who never reaped the profit of largely a 17 year period um, of, of profit within the mining sector. Um, felt um, the, the the bore the bear, you know basically bore the brunt of of the downturn um, when, when it came and that happened of course um, around here when the economy was contracting around 2012 over here 
actually over a year, more or less. Um, so those social, social, what you call social ecological struggles, um, it's not based really, I think, essentially here because the workers um, are trying to grab the land from the employer. No, they're not doing that. Um, they are trying to grab a, 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 a place for their own social reproduction. And as you remember, the within the land, the way production happens has changed fundamentally to a large extent. The amount of workers who now live and reside on a farm is far, far smaller than they've ever been. So that is why you have all these uh, new townships and, and, and um, squatter camps that are being formed outside of the farm areas and around um, the towns, and if, which is given um, a, a, a point of power to workers, actually. And this is the interesting contradiction of the changes to the labor process over the last 20 years. The fact that you had now these new communities, expelled communities from the land, people were expelled from the land, forming new neighborhoods and new communities meant that they could now organize outside of the farm. So a lot of the way people were resisted uh, was also outside of the farm. They had connections with inside of the farm, which was a totally new kind of scenario um, that is happening within the, the, the area of farming. Um, which of course has its source since the government introduced its uh, neoliberal program and land reform um, in the mid 1990s. Um, the most difficult question is the way forward. I think the way forward really is to is for people to understand that workers go through firstly through ebbs and flows. That the scenarios which people have sketched, which have sketched out that the death of the labor movement is not true. Uh, that the labor movement won't die. Uh, it has to resist. It has no choice but to resist. The point really is how it resists and whether it can consolidate that resistance is, is very, very important. And I think the unity of the labor movement is crucial. Um, I think that there has to be, noting the changes within the labor process, unions cannot organize based on a model that they adopted since the 70s, 1973 onwards. There has to be a change in how they, they orientate the organization, the institution, and how they relate to workers. I myself working with NUM and other unions for about seven years, I consistently fought and argued that they had to embark upon a dramatic change in organization, an attempt to decentralize the union and to move in sectors which they don't take seriously, because it is probably in your sector where, you, where which you don't take seriously where the big struggles may uh, occur um, sometime in, in, in the future. I'm not sure if I've answered, um, or at least I've attempted to answer everyone's um, question. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks for those responses. Eddie, let's move to the chat now. I think there are a couple of uh, comments in the chat. Um, um, you want me to read them or uh, let's go through it? Lufefe is saying greetings. OK, greetings to me, but uh, I'm just interested in what uh, could be the view in relation to the low levels of strike action in the retail industry, especially considering especially considering that it is one of the most vulnerable industries globally, um, considering working conditions, contracts, but precarity there in that sector. I'm thinking that it would be that it would not be an ease, as easy as meaning that the workers in the industry are docile. Um, he continues to say, but maybe some interpretation centered vulnerability, which creates our hesitancy, hesitance uh, and fear due to precarity. Uh, what could be the view uh, in that relating to that? Uh, one thinks of Amazon, for example, and uh, and uh, on, I mean, the changes in technology and all that. Then Ian Esser, my colleague um, in, in EXEC, he raises to the prof uh, how successful have unions been RE strike action to achieve their labor demands per recent decades? How successful have unions been in their achieving those demands, market experiments um, to ensure more workers benefit from union participation in buying shares, share, share, share participation in stock market and in strengthening unions uh, financially? Then Janet Cherry, Professor Cherry, they, uh, good to hear you, see you, Janet. 
What are the implications of the high levels of strikes from community sector? And that's an interesting point, um, who I think uh, you said are white collar public sector not being exploited in the same way as production workers and how this impacts on the state's functioning and legitimacy. And then Farrell again uh, taking another bite. Uh, he says, thanks, Eddie. I think the point that labor is being bought up in HR bargaining mechanisms is likely, uh, even if unintentionally, part of the reason the macro inequities, uh, especially in inequalities, especially in SA, is largely not uh, struggled against um, by not all of the organized labor, maybe less so by SAFTU, um, for example, who seem to focus more on state failure of the working class. So they're interesting questions. Uh, I hope you've got all of uh, the, uh, you, I'm sure you caught all of them. Um, thanks, Eddie. Okay, thanks so much for all these wonderful questions. Um, retail strikes. Um, that's very, very interesting because this is very long and uh, it's quite personal as well. I was the national uh, researcher and educator for Sakao um, in 1997. And one of the big problems that I pose there is why aren't we organizing the casuals, uh, the casual workers? And it, and it took a massive strike of casual workers for Sakao at that time, a few years later, then to recognize the importance um, of casual workers. And I think this is, I think, is the key thing. If you if your strategy is to maintain a permanent workforce, you will lose uh, because it means that you are ignoring other workers who are equally a worker. There is no worker who is more equal, sorry, uh, more equal than the other. Um, and they all are employed and they all exchange their labor powers um, within the workplace. So change can only come through unity and um, of workers, uh, regardless of the um, position in the company, condition of employment. And I think that the, the strikes within um, within the retail, uh, let's go back there quickly. Um, I think it's over here somewhere, the last industry. Somewhere over here, uh, over here. Must be this one, yeah. Uh, here we go. It's 8.5%. Um, that this point does appear quite low compared to where they were they were many, many years ago. But I think here yeah, there is a real crisis and a real failure uh, to have embarked on an organizing strategy uh, for workers who are in more precarious position. And the way to do that is often to be do it outside of the workplace. In other words, there are many means in which you can organize workers. Workers often go home the same bus on the same train and somewhere. And as I've said earlier on, the advice really is, is for unions to decentralize and actually open union offices at community level. Where you can call upon these workers to actually come together um, and to actually meet where the workers find themselves. I know there have been other experiments around the retail sector. Um, where workers in a mall have come together to form a committee and to to organize around that. It's not an easy road. It is difficult, um, but it's the only uh, option for trade unions. And I think everyone thought that the construction sector, you can't organize and sustain workers. But I think uh, during the World Cup, I was also working with the unions there. Uh, we recruited 27,000 workers over a three year period. Uh, of course, it was with a boom within the economy, but the unions didn't follow through, which was to decentralize and to ensure that they are able to work um, as a union at a community level, uh, because all these workers um, have to go back to the communities. And even if you have a mobile workplace, which is construction, you work in one building year, a few months, and you work in the next building. Uh, it's very unusual for you to work for seven, eight years on the same area unless you're working on a new energy plant like Mandupi and Kusile, which they did um, in those kinds of years. So there is ways and means to, to organize workers um, so on. Now, 
the way I've measured the success to come into Ian's question um, of the labor movement is the, the key way to assess the, the, the success is to look at the wage share versus profit. And the, what we have really is another interesting um, fact, which I've done through my PhD, which I'll publish, late, which will come out later um, into, in the form of a book. But I was actually stunned when I found out during the wage share analysis is that the labor movement has been able to regain lost ground. And the lost ground around about 2015, 2016, in shifting up the wage share to around 51%. I think when it came to about two, the year 2000, it was somewhere at around 40, 46%. And that tells us that, that there has been some successes in terms of the way the labor movement has been able to tackle this. Now, what you don't have here in this presentation is actually my detailed analysis of all those strikes. And I will send you the paper maybe after this. Um, it's going to be published later in the year, but for the purposes of those people who are eager to come, I will share it with you. But there I show what actually transpired during the period. The fact that the unions opened their doors to seasonal, casual and part-time workers and started to unify a lot around uh, labor broking um, and so on, and for to ensure that all workers are able to have the same standards, that was very significant. I guess that that now has fell by the wayside after 2012, 2014, that approach the unions had, um, and it's back to business as usual, but that period was actually a very new period. It was a qualitatively distinct phase in which the labor movement was able to interact with all kinds of workers. I don't believe that share options and these things will, will fundamentally resolve the plight of, of the workers. Um, I mean, we have had unions for the last 20 years with investment companies. I'm, I'm completely opposed to trade union investment companies. Um, and I, that's for another webinar. I feel that that is part to explain the reason why some of the unions uh, have become to so bureaucratized and can't move out of the framework um, of the industrial relations systems. So they've become to a large extent conformist um, to expectations. Um, and the only way that workers can actually um, invest their funds more appropriately for my, for my own view is to establish a national housing bank. Um, but that's also a subject. <laughs> but you can see the unions are not doing that. They're all in the private sector. They, they, they're becoming business institutions, um, making profits of other workers. And all that they are doing through those is actually increasing the level of inequality between officials and workers. So a general secretary today earns the same um, as the most senior person in a in a medium sized um, enterprise, you know, earning on average, let's say 80 between 70 and 90,000 rand a, a month. I mean, that's insane. That's the same what a professor earns at university. But this is a trade union. It's not uh, a different uh, a, a and its job is to look at the conditions um, of employment. Um, and I think I'm, st I'm still just to see a study which can really, really show uh, the benefits of these kinds of schemes. I think what we really need is a, a vigorous um, reallocation of funds from trade union investment companies to socially necessary um, um, uh, industries, sorry, or enterprises or projects such as a, as a national um, housing bank. Um, the implications of the struggle really for public sector workers is that, and I think for the public sector unions, um, is that the bottom layers within the public sector are the ones who are driving the strikes um, by and large. Uh, the, the interesting thing is that most of the strikes in 2020 during hard lockdown was in the public sector. Um, as well, and my reading of strikes all of this this period, um, last 20 years, is that there is a significant amount of unprotected strikes that occur within the 
the um, public sector um, as a whole. The implications of, I think in the long term is that the public sector will remain a big player in terms of strike action, which I think is positive um, because here you have a large layer of, of workers who do have some kind of some kind of financial means uh, to engage in the broader struggles uh, and the economic struggles on a more consistent and sorry consistent uh, level. Um, the question really now is whether the current public unions are able to drive a program that goes counter to the program led by Cyril Ramaphosa which for, in my opinion really is one of the most dangerous people because what you've had as a distinguishing factor since um, he became deputy president um, was that he drove down the question of strikes and implementation of new strike laws and that rings for me uh, that was a significant achievement I think by and of itself to be able to do that first of all but it rings off of, of alarm bells of what is still to come. Uh, because once you start opening the door to changes, uh, regressive changes in the right to strike, uh, it, it means that when you are weak, other legislation will follow. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that Labour has been able to at least um, derail um, privatization for some time or at least ensure that there isn't wholesale privatization but I think with a new administration um, I don't think Labour has really realized what we have as the new administration and the implications the new administration has um, for Labour and so I think that you have to have the key um, stock taking um, in order to, to, to draw up a new strategy um, otherwise, I think the public sector could be in, of course, significant um, danger. But this is the whole thing about strikes over the short term and strikes over the long term. There is always change that comes over course of time. Uh, and I think every in the in the in the, in the early 60s, they said. Uh, strikes are withering away uh, because there was the workers movement were no longer on strike. Um, some were enjoying the fruits of social democracy. Others were enjoying the fruits of the anti-colonial struggles. And then to everyone's surprise, you had the upsurge in the late 60s and then it carried on right into the 80s and for some countries into the 1990s. Um, so I think there's, there's no room for despair that workers will struggle. Now in terms of the questions of the um, inequalities and the that are increasing over time. Uh, the only way to reduce, I think, by and large, the inequalities uh, is to encourage workers to strike. <laughs> there is absolutely no other option um, around that. I think the unions um, have adopted, an, as I said before, an uncritical approach to, to industrial um, legislation. And the whole thing of three year agreements are, I think, by and large, to the detriment um, of workers in my time at LRS. Uh, when I reviewed the data on improvements in wages um, through long term agreements, I found that workers who engage in local agreements uh, prosper more than workers who have long term agreements. And that, of course, I think dispels, you know, all the myths of social contracts between labor and capital. Um, and it shows that workers must resist on, on, on an annual basis. Um, and by resisting on an annual basis, they are able to unify and ensure that they are in touch with the base um, of, of workers. When you embark on long term agreements with employers, you are divorced from the shop floor because now you can rest and you think you can go to meetings and just engage on the policy um, and at the, the, the political um, levels. So I think um, 
I don't think I quite got um, the, the last question. Um, Barry, can you just repeat the last question? It was Farrell's question. Last question. The last question. Um, OK, there is a new last question there. Uh, yeah. Are you wanting the one from Farrell or the one that's there currently? There's one from, OK, I'll read both and then you can respond. The last yeah. question was from Farrell. Thank you. The, the second to last, I think the point that Labour is being caught up in HR bargaining, I think you addressed that, is yeah. likely to unintentionally part of the reason for the macro inequalities. I think you raised that. And then the Pumla Tilingela is raising, has the industrial revolution and the digital revolution impact the traditional method of striking? Will we start to see a new trend in striking as opposed to physically marching and staying away? Are there other methods that can be explored considering the social media and other social and technology savvy platforms? Yeah, um, that's a very, very important question. Thank you for that. Look, um, this point of workers not being able to struggle because of new technologies is not a new argument, actually. It's, it, it comes up through every technological revolution. Um, if we recall, maybe the, the most recent technological revolution was the, the dot-com revolution. And um, if we recall, there was major theorizations of a, a post-industrial workforce, for example, and a new order of a post-waste um, order. Um, but actually, we saw the, the converse um, happening. Uh, the new era of dot com produced more waste than the prior period that existed um, um, before. Um, in fact, at a much more rapid rate, which is why we're facing the, the climate um, catastrophe that we, we all talk about. Uh, in terms of introduction of new um, uh, labor processes in the factories and so on, yes, that did occur, but yet workers still come out um, on strike um, and in a significant uh, showing. And I think the period from 2011 to till the current period has shown um, to all those theorists that they were actually quite wrong in terms of how they viewed technological change and the fact that it would really um, uh, diminish the power of, of labor. There are other factors which I want to have time for, which I think um, Farrell was hinting on, is the fact that I think uh, politically what you have is a complete disarming of labor ideologically and a complete accommodation of what I consider to be the normative political terrain. In other words, there's been such a com an accommodation that labor movement can't, or at least in some ways, in a very contradictory manner, it can. It has shown its muscle and it will show its muscle in the future, um, but it hasn't been able to ideologically stand independently. And that I think is a great task confronting, the, or at least the organized labor movement, is its independence from government and its independence from, from capital um, that we are talking about. So the new digital um, methods we're currently seeing, uh, I know they call it uh, um, um, digital uh, production or something. Sorry, I forgot the name of the concept. Um, Look, with all new technological change, workers will find their feet and they will have to um, find ways of challenging the system. Um, even if you look at the existing strikes that workers have um, embarked on, we found that there's a new wave, sorry, of strikes at Amazon.com, which, has, which hasn't been there. But unfortunately, for workers to find their feet, it takes a long, long time. And um, so as new, te new, te te sorry, new technologies are rolled out, I had too much caffeine this morning, um, 
workers will struggle. There will be some kind of, of, of diminishing of the um, their strength, but they will eventually work a way around that system. In the same way, I think post office workers showed us the lead um, when they went on the, the strike um, and they went beyond the current uh, legislative framework and said, no, we're going to now embark on other forms of struggle in order to be employed permanently um, in the workforce. Now, the interesting fact, if you look at the, the data of employment and the conversion of casual to permanent, another success of the unions uh, have actually been a conversion of uh, a lot of casual workers into permanent workers. Now, that's an interesting dynamic. I don't have the stat here with me, it's in another paper, but that's for another discussion. But I think most social commenta commentators or analysts don't look at these kinds of data to see what is actually transpiring. Because if you look at the 80s, for example, what you had was also a conversion of casual workers or migrant workers who then became permanent workers, right? While at the same time, employers were starting retrenchments of workers, but workers were able to absorb new forms of employment. So, Nothing is really static, in other words. What I'm trying to say is it doesn't mean that because your terms of employment is A, that it will always be A. Um, and that uh, concerted thinking, concerted action around this, which I think the unions will have to do, um, is to find ways around it. Um, and I think recently workers in the new digital economy have shown that they are able to, to organize um, around that. Um, so, for example, you have now the strikes by the the Uber workers that have occurred, and I think that's also quite significant um, as well. Um, but I think the there has to be some kind of it's probably too early to say what form or shape they're going to, to have. They have formed some kind of associations. They've started to think of legislative changes that need to occur. But here again, I think is where organized labor needs to lend a helping hand. It is here where they have to use their muscle in the legal um, um, offices or desks to help and support financially the struggles of these kinds of workers. And I think Noom, despite all that has happened, was quite successful at doing that during the World Cup strike, in which there was 26. They, they gave the resources to the workers who were organized and said, listen, you will enter some problems and we are availing our funds and personnel to you without taking over your struggle. And I think this is the other important thing. Because you're union, a union doesn't mean you always have to have a self-interest. The thing is to also share the resources of the union for other workers, including if you haven't um, been able to organize them. I don't know if I've answered that question as best as I can. It's a difficult one. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Eddie, uh, Dr. Kotel. Thank you for that input. Uh, at this time, I want to just acknowledge uh, the speaker of the Eastern Cape Provincial Legislature, um, Honorable Ellen Souls August, um, and uh, we just want to welcome the speaker to this uh, session. Um, I see uh, Nzwana, your hand is up, um, Mr. Makaule. Uh, you can uh, uh, come uh, raise your question. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Barry, and uh, thank you, Doc, for for such an insightful, indeed, presentation. And good afternoon to yourselves and uh, uh, the colleagues uh, in the in the platform. Um, uh, please forgive me if I've, uh, my first part of the question was uh, um, attended to. Uh, I got uh, some internet glitches on my side. I miss uh, a bit of your reply to the colleagues. But um, my question number one really alludes to, to, to exactly how you were responding to the first uh, 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 round of questions that were, were asked here. Uh, that, uh, sure, in South Africa, we've got unions. 
and they've been um, performing and going according to the trends. Helpfully, helpfully uh, you shared that with, with us. And over and beyond um, uh, the, the, the work of the unions um, uh, and across uh, whether the, the workers would fall within the um, uh, blue collar or white collar, you have had some lobby groups um, which uh, with close examination, you'd understand they are fighting for the same cause. Um, uh, lack of transformation here, here and uh, inequalities, um, particularly income inequality uh, to a greater, greater extent. We all know, as you have shared, some of the main reasons for a strike. Um, um, they, they need to come to an end. Um, uh, you can fight for a particular cause uh, and they need to drive the success, by the way, of some of the reasons for people to strike. Uh, needs to drive, uh, it is when uh, it is non-existence. They need to drive themselves to non-existence. In income and quality, uh, we shouldn't strike for income and quality uh, if it is not existent. So the success of it is, is non-existent. So is the reason for the existence of other lobby groups, I argue. Then my question on that is, do you, uh, based on the trends uh, on, on the strike, uh, can we say there has been accumulative returns uh, to some of the causal reasons uh, for the strikes uh, in the country uh, for the period that you that you've been looking at, uh, hasn't the, are there any accumulative returns? Uh, are the reasons for striking becoming lower and lower uh, ultimately uh, to disappear? My second uh, uh, question uh, would then be, uh, and can you therefore say because uh, uh, would all understand that um, uh, resorting to strike uh, is perhaps uh, as a result of a, a lack of consensus, um, ideological consensus, uh, and so on and so forth. Can we, because of that, say, therefore, South Africa uh, is a political justice country based on that? Are we a political justice of country? I'm boring that to that body of work of liberal political uh, conceptions of justice. Um, in light of that body of work and that school of thought, are we a political justice country? Then the last, uh, the last one. Uh, well, this is a follow up really on on what you were saying about um, uh, uh, the bureau, the bureaucratic phenomena that is now espoused uh, uh, the, the unions uh, where you would have um, office bearers, um, the amount of money they get paid. Uh, as you are mentioning now, it's comparatively to the, the professorship uh, and so on. Uh, is, uh, the, is the commodification or has the, the lead, leadership positions, am I right to assume that they've become a commodity uh, is it viewed, being a leadership position of a union, is it viewed as a, as a means to an end? Or is it uh, uh, um, a patriotism, activism uh, for a just cause? Um, um, uh, I, I hope, I hope uh, I'm not, uh, because I was trying to <laughs> perhaps uh, um, uh, make the question even to my head as simple as it is possible. Have we commodified? Um, the leadership leadership position. Uh, there are a lot of disagreement. Uh, conferences that have been taking place, they don't finish on time, and um, two uh, members being expelled. Such destructions in those leadership are not emasculating the cause that a union stands for, because before we can even get the equality that we're fighting for. Are, are those description because of what I assume is commodification of leadership position in existence? Uh, thank you, and um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Doc. Do I have another taker? Anybody else who's got a point or a question? Zwan, Zwan, I see your hand is still up. Oh, oh sorry, I'm I'm lowering it. Sorry. Um, and then uh, Eddie. Um, as you know, I think from outside as EXEC, um, which is a multi-sectoral consultative council, which is uh, actually a public entity of government um, that works uh, with uh, the organized union with multiple uh, uh, sectors and 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 uh, uh, um, formations in society from universities, organized labor, local government, um, uh, organized business. Um, trying to build and, and even civil society to see consensus um, on critical um, 
to build a, a co-produce, let me say, through the provincial development strategy, through um, uh, consensus, and it, that consensus might not be always a, um, I mean, it, uh, things are dynamic and they shift, but where there's an agreement and a, and a, and a broad understanding that a co-producing the future, co-producing a joint, um, how well, can I put it now, a, a, a shared vision and uh, part the driving partnership engagements towards initiatives such as um, employment, uh, growing the economy so that we can uh, create a more spatially just economy in the Eastern Cape. Um, we can ensure that there is um, inclusivity, especially in a province such as the Eastern Cape with such deep, um, uh, what's the word, uh, uh, poverty levels that is so, so uh, significantly in need of having all sectors move together. Um, and I hear your voice, I hear the, 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 the points that you made, um, and I know that those views are there, uh, that uh, the consensus, you know, is a, uh, the outlook is a bit pessimistic sometimes, uh, but uh, what is your take on that? Because I think there's something to be said there and to explore that. And and if you take, for example, all of the social partners that uh, one would typically seek um, to move together on in partnership engagement uh, through platforms, through processes, um, driving development, um, uh, what is your take there? I mean, I, 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 uh, I would like to, to put forward and say that I still think there is a role for that, even though um, various uh, groups, there is definitely a role for that and where groupings differ and sectors have interests, competing interests. I think there should be an interest that overrides the, the competing interests for all actually uh, within uh, those, uh, um, within, within society. So I just wanted your view on that. Yeah. <clears throat> No, thank you so much for all the great um, questions. Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, Eddie. Yes, Dr. Oh, okay. Patel, you audible? All right. Look, I think that the, the, the issue of accumulative returns, um, and social justice, and then the issue of commodification of leadership are just such important um, issues. Um, in terms of the what you term accumulative returns for labor, the question for labor really is that it it cannot sustain such accumulative returns. In other words, despite the great efforts, so you could have periods which has happened um, where you've had stronger employment happening patterns increases in remuneration, but those are always temporary gains. Um, they are never sustained in the complete sense of, of the word. And that, of course, is because of the dynamic of um, the social system that we have um, in the country and, also, of course, generally speaking. Um, so the question is then, do you have uh, a, a political justice in, 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 in a system where that kind of fragility is systemic to, to such a system. Um, and I don't really um, um, think so. Um, so, which implies that if this is the system that we, we have, you have to then um, always be on your guard and you always have to look out um, at what is happening because the playing field is, of course, majorly unequal. Um, you have those who have vast sums of wealth and they drive the economy and to some extent they have very powerful influence then um, on state policy. And so the rest of society is there then to contest the state and to contest how such accumulation accumulation happens and how it is redistributed um, in society with its consequent inequalities and lack of transformation as we know it. On the other hand, 
those who are largely also in power or a new elite and so on also drive inequality because as a means for their own accumulation. And um, this is why your, your question um, or your analysis or assessment is so important when you ask, has there been a commodification of leadership in the unions? Um, and by that, by that you mean, of course, a broad a, a concept of leadership being vehicles for access to career, power, um, and resources. And of course, yes, that is absolutely true um, by and large um, and extent that the union, because it is a powerful um, institution, and it is rooted and it is rooted within a system of wealth um, from workers, is able to exert powers and is able to liaise uh, in a co-determinist co -determinist, uh, manner with business um, and government. And so those two arenas are constantly a threat to the way leadership will then behave or orientate um, its politics or its views on um, trade unions as an organization and its purpose um, and its role. So a new role for unions have been carved out in the last 20 years. The role is essentially that you will work within the framework of the legislation, um, you will conduct negotiations and collective bargaining, you will participate in uh, structures uh, where there is some kind of co-determinist uh, arrangements, um, and that has been the kind of the nuts and bolts um, um, of um, how this has has, has uh, transpired um, with serious consequences, obviously. So, and for me, part of the commodification of the leadership is directly because the unions invested, or sorry, took workers' money and started to bring in investment companies um, into the unions. And that dynamic has, I think, is under researched really, it hasn't really been analyzed be because it changed the values of leadership, and it started to change the orientation uh, of how workers then view um, exploitation. Um, look, there's always a space for some kind of cooperation. I'm not, I'm not saying that there isn't any space, um, they, and there should be spaces for, co for um, some kind of co cooperation, because we're all interested in building a just and sustainable um, society. Um, but here again, I think the, the dilemma is the great powers of the different stakeholders uh, coming on board, what the nature is um, of that cooperation, which I can't talk about abstractly. It's always a concrete matter of what's put on the table for cooperation. Um, and from my side, as I, as I said, is that if you're going to look at such a cooperation, it means fundamentally undermining the outsourcing and contract system in South Africa, which is the source of major corruption in the country and a false sense of transformation um, that has occurred thus far. I mean, if you take the COSAR 2 September conference, I think it was 1997, the conclusion there was, in even that early period, that the manner in which the private commodification has now been uh, uh, internalized into the public has broken the system and it has it broke the system um, because what you had now was a, a system of uh, nepotism developing uh, ultra kind of uh, sense of competition for resources whereas and of course the the the, the draining of the, the public sector's resources, uh, human resources as well. A lot of the skilled people became private contractors and had to uh, basically become part of some kind of mechanism to get access to contracts. And I think even though you have uh, a lot of economic chambers and institutions, I'm yet to see a study which looks at, for example, the impact of that system um, on the public purse over the last uh, 20 or so years. And I'm sure you're going to find that 
all the arguments that were made in 1997 um, by the government that you would now through this new vehicles have a more efficient um, public sector and so on. If you private out uh, uh, most or at least some of its, its functions and so on, and it will save the state more money. And of course, we all know it hasn't saved the state more money. It is in fact, um, allow the state to be drained of, of resources uh, financially and also of, of skills. Um, so Barry, yes, it is a, it's a very difficult question and I'm very interested in that, uh, that there has to be some kind of socially necessary investment and on, and on a large scale um, for that to, to, um, to happen. Um, I can't see it happening uh, in the way that it has happened over the I think, last period. Um, you do, of course, have the six success theories here and there. Um, but I think unless you have labor driving a major social investment project, I can't see um, a sustainable kind of return on accumulation. <laughs> Um, and a redistribution of, of, of some kind of that wealth. Um, so, I mean, we can be clear that the private banking sector has dismally failed. I mean, if you just go through, I mean, not only private, of course, we also look at the public as well. And we need to start unpacking those kinds of, uh, of, of things as well. Um, but yeah, that's the, the bit I can and talk about and say. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Quattle, and uh, thank you for that um, insightful um, uh, presentation um, and for sharing your your research with us. Just for, uh, 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 for the audiences here, when is that paper going to be released and where will it be published? Is it in the International Labor Review the, on the data that you're presenting um, or is it already released? Um. No, it's going to probably be published in the next quarter. Um, it's by the Global Labour Journal. It will be there. Um, but I can maybe give uh, um, my draft <laughs> to those who are very interested in, in having it as well. well. At least the presentation with uh, if that uh, presentation is really the data that you're presenting is insightful in terms of just uh, how you use the quality, the quantitative data that you present um, and uh, making qualitative sense of it as you put it. Um, so colleagues, I want to thank you, uh, everybody that uh, participants in the meeting um, that are here, those who asked questions. I want to check the chat if there was any additional comment before I close. Um, uh, we would appreciate the draft edits, what Farrell is saying. And uh, uh, so thank you very much, uh, Eddie, for this presentation and thank you to all the colleagues um, and colleagues, thank you for participating and joining in exec, uh, external webinars. Um, and uh, we thank you very much for your engagement today, uh, for the presentation and for your time. Um, I think we are exactly uh, nine minutes. Oh, well, we actually over time. <laughs> so <laughs> my mistake. So thank you very much and thank you for 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 joining. Thank you, Dr. Cottle. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Barry, and to Exec for hosting me and to everyone who's been here. I'm surprised by the turnout. I'm, I hope that uh, the presentation has stimulated interest in studying strikes and also in looking at uh, the importance of looking at strike data and its implications and uh, how we can view labor in a different lens yes. and, and uh, have a more comprehensive understanding of, of how workers are trying to struggle for change. Thank you so much to everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Doc. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Eddie. Thank Thanks. you so much, Eddie and Barry. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye.